What's up guys? I'm John the Potter. Welcome to the studio. I've had a vision for a long time to talk to other artists and potters and share with you things about their story, their work, their business, and their studio. And I did that with Matthew Kelly. So this is the highlight version of that interview that we did with him. Check it out. So take us back to like how you got started in pottery. I uh, made my first couple pieces at the end of middle school. So like eighth grade. Went to the county high school uh, here and I, I thought, you know, I'd like to try pottery as an independent project at the end of the year. So that following year, I got my first job. Like a week before I turned 16, I got hired at a pottery shop here in Seagrove. And so I went there and I remember the older guy that ran the place, you know, he's like, all right, here, just throw me something. Yeah. Just hand me a clay ball. And yeah. I just had to stand at the wheel and throw something. And my, my dad had to drive me down there because I, I wasn't even 16 yet. When I started, I had to make 500 straight-sided tea glasses before I ever got to make another shape. That and they all looked horrible. <laughs> <laughs> at least now looking back at it, I'm like, yeah, man, right. that's, you know. But the fact that he was willing to, to pay me to to learn. I mean, right. I was jacked. I was yeah. just excited to be yeah. there. Wanted to go out and work for some other potters as like a journeyman. And so I spent, you know, 20 plus years working as a journeyman for several of the potters in the Seagrove area. Really honed in my skill and made a lot of different pots for a lot of different potters. Um, and I got pretty good. I got pretty fast at throwing and that helped me make good money doing that. Yeah. And so for a long time, I didn't even really think that much about making my own pots because I was making pretty good money just working for other people. And when I got done, I got to come home and I didn't have to fire it or put a handle on it or glaze it or yeah. sell it. And at a certain point I thought, you know what, I'm really, I'm really starting to waste my skill and my time. And now I, I can't imagine going to work for anybody else. Yeah, was, yeah. Just, I would hate it. <laughs> and we were talking the other night and and thought that you had thrown probably over 250,000 pieces. Yeah, easily. That's like the opposite of my story, you know? It's like <laughs> I jumped into my own business and then learned along the way. Yeah. That Once I started making Matthew Kelly pottery pots, mm -hmm. everything I sold, I'm like, man, I'm darn proud of what's out there. Yeah, so that's right. uh, one of the quotes I heard early on was that uh, repetition was the mother of all skill. I, I truly think anybody could do pottery if they really wanted to, if they uh -huh. were willing to put in the time and develop the skill. But if you have a talent where you're artistic to begin with, it'll make that process quicker and you'll be even better at it. You pretty much throw a rock anywhere around here and you're gonna hit a pot. How do you stand out? How do so many potters survive? Yeah, when I started in pottery, uh, it definitely was a lot different. Um, people would travel to Seagrove, you know, every weekend. On a Saturday, there was a line of people waiting. At some time during that Saturday, there was a line of people waiting, just standing in line at the shop waiting to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, over, you know, over the period that I was working for different people, that gradually changed. Um, and then there's still the old school potters that like probably don't know how to turn a computer on and don't yeah. want to know. Yeah. First shop I worked at was a very traditional shop and, and they were kind of even against the whole art pottery thing when it first started to happen in Seagrove. It uh -huh. kind of was like looked down upon like because they were a really traditional. It is pretty amazing that that many shops can survive here in Seagrove. Online selling is definitely a thing, but I. I kind of thought, man, pottery is one of those things that's really hard to sell online because number one, it's harder to ship. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you talk about when you pull out a cup out of the kiln and you're like, man, if you could just see this in person, yeah. it's so cool, so cool. But the quality of photo and video that yeah. has changed oh, over gosh, the last yeah. five, six years Definitely. where you're able to communicate kind of more what the pottery looks like yeah. opposed to, you know, maybe six, seven years ago where you really had to have a nice camera and you had to have perfect lighting. But yes. now you got your iPhone and you snap picture, you get a pretty good idea what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, too, I've worked for people that sold uh, in the end price, sold coffee mugs for 12 or $15 yep. all the way up to people that sold mugs for $30. And it was funny because like, I made the mug for each of these right, two people right. yeah, and one of them's so twice funny. as much in the end yeah. price. If you make good pots, I, I really think there's a market for you to sell them. Because I remember first building uh, my studio and then walking in with the wheel <laughs> and like, I've been throwing pots for over 20 years and walking in and being like, dang, I don't know what to make. Didn't want to make pieces that were just like anybody that I worked for. Because I was still throwing for other people for the first like five or six years. I mean, I remember from even early on, like when I was young, young, working that first shop I worked at, I was interested in like wood fired and salt glazed. Mm -hmm. So I went and met Joseph and ended up firing with him for five years, three times a year. So I fired his kiln 15 times and I would get space in the kiln for all the work that I would give him kind of as a barter. You know, all the glazes I did in an electric kiln just they all looked the same mm -hmm. to me. It kind of had all the same feel and it just, I don't know, it just kind of felt blah. Part of the idea behind building the wood kiln also was the business model because I knew there was a customer base that uh, was still interested in coming to kiln opening events and mm -hmm. seeing the kiln and buying the pieces in person at your shop. And I thought, you know what, that sounds really 
really nice as far as from a from a making and a lifestyle standpoint to be able to make the pots here fire them here sell them here get people here that can i can meet in person that can you know, come here and see the kiln and just have an experience i definitely was interested in gas fired reduction work the potter in georgia that i did the barter for for my brick for my wood kiln when i finished that barter he was kind of like i think like man i still would like to have you making pots for me yeah. but i don't you know there's what nothing else, else i need to yeah yeah he called me up one day and he's like hey he's like you need a gas kiln and i'm like why and he, so anyway we just worked out a deal where he said hey man i'll bring you the kiln and the brick if you'll just you know like do another barter with me to make pots but i just started testing tons and tons of different glazes when we would fire his wood kiln and then when i got the gas kiln i was like well geez i wonder if some of these would work in my gas kiln too oh, yeah. i found now yeah like four or five really good glazes and then i've started playing around with testing others you know layering on top and bottom and just finding different ways to use them one of the things i think that's so cool i was going to say this when you were talking before about wood kilns is the way that it brings a lot of potters together they're willing to give you a bunch of free help because you can't really fire one of these things alone it's yeah. like you need a lot of help like yesterday when we were firing this thing, my I was wearing my fitness watch and my heart rate was like at 140 or 150 for like five hours straight. And that's like, a, I was like I'm running a marathon. And that was like three to four people here working. Yeah, and I, I was one of three people working. One of the reasons I built my kiln the size I did is because I thought um, I would like to make it big enough that I could offer space to other potters. Uh, they could come and put, put some work in, help me fire. They have a vested interest in the process and learning. And the amount that I learned working and firing with other potters was just amazing. Like that's just something, yeah, you can learn a lot as we've talked about on YouTube, but being in person. I've been here for three days learning constantly and you can't make a video that's three days long, like asking the questions all the time that you really need to know and seeing how it's done. You know, like I could tell someone to side stoke, you have to like put a, put a piece of pine in and then like like get it in there. You only have a you know a foot of space between pots to put this piece of pine in. You put two in there and then you put one down there. But you only do that at the end of the firing. <laughs> like there's all these little nuanced things. Yeah. That there's just it would be way too much. There's a lot of work in here. Not only just the kiln itself, but all the pots in it. And like you mess something up and you use a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah, I do functional and decorative work. And I would say that yeah, mugs is like out of numbers of pieces, I make more mugs than I do anything. Uh, dinnerware sets to you know coffee mugs of course I make a lot of vases you know um, uh, utensil holders you know I love making lidded jars that's probably one of my favorite things to make you know I think if I make a good quality piece of pottery and and I have the ability to make it look better with some artwork or some slip decoration or things like that then I think it's it's worth it I definitely really enjoy making large pieces I, I do like I have one in here that I'm gonna have a hard time selling like it's Probably the biggest one you've yeah, ever made. Probably the, one of the biggest pieces I've ever made and definitely the nicest large piece I've ever made. I have to so yeah. if I make a six pound vase and I make a 20 or a 50 pound vase, I want it to like, like man, that's a good looking piece. And so the fact that I can make a piece that like, I got to carry like this. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. man, I yeah. did it. You yeah, know? yeah, that's. I started selling my work probably five or six years ago and, and I did that just through a local gallery and then uh, like a couple of local shows because I didn't even have like my studio really set up to where I could sell here. So the shows you'd pay like a booth fee, but I, I really enjoyed shows because that's where I got to meet the people that were buying the pieces. And so I, I'm a pretty social person that has to work by myself all the time, other than when I fire my wood kiln. So yeah. that's, I kind of got tired of people being like, hey, where's your stuff for sale? You know, like I live in Idaho, where can I get some of your work? I was just like, man, this doesn't work. And then actually seeing John, uh, seeing your videos about uh, selling on Etsy. So then I, I thought, well, I'll give Etsy a shot. I would still say I still sell more work. Uh, even last year, I still sold more work in person. Really? I did two kiln openings here at my house. And so this year could re come really close to either being half or even more online than yeah. in person. Uh, definitely being known because of YouTube and Instagram has helped that. I've thought a lot about that because I was the same way. You know, I sold all my pottery for years and years and years just at the coffee shops, yeah. right? And I felt like it was a lot. It was like I was selling like $30,000 of yeah. pottery a year at the coffee shops. Yeah. It's like, I'll, I'll never sell that much online. Yeah. And, but yeah, last year was probably 70% online, 30% wow. in person, whereas so before amazing. it was 95%. Yeah. And, uh, it's just the whole business model has shifted. Uh, since I quit working for other potters, I, I like literally have no other income source um, other than just selling my own pottery, which I think probably <laughs> worries my wife more than me. Yeah. Because you know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's like, okay, you know, we got to, you know, but. And then uh, 2020, you know, it's still, even though all that happened in 2020, I still 
paid off debt. I have no more debt on what I had to borrow to finish building my kiln. Like I paid off every bit of my debt in 2020, like excited to uh, going forward how, how it can get better. Um, I still love in-person stuff. So I think, like I said, with wood firing and the in-person sales, I just love to be able to meet people and show them the kiln. I initially started YouTube because I thought, I knew from my years in pottery that when people came to a shop that I was working at, if they watched me make something, even though it wasn't my work, they would be more likely to buy something if they watched it being made. Yes. And then I started seeing you and you were just like skyrocketing. I'm like, dang, I need to like yeah. <laughs> focus on this a bit more. You know, it, yeah. could, it could actually be something. Like, cause I had already established myself in the amount of work I was selling pottery wise. And I knew I had to keep that up because that was my main source of income. Right. So I always had to think of it in a way that I was like, okay, I'm a potter who makes YouTube videos. Yep. I'm not a yep. YouTuber who makes pottery. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I got to think of it in that way. So pottery comes first. You know, I've always been a proponent of having multiple revenue streams. Yep. Like I have the cock shop and pottery and all this stuff. and because if one goes down, you know, like yeah. you know, when COVID hit, the YouTube AdSense kind of dove for a yeah, while, but the, the pottery sales went up or remained the same. And so at a certain point, you do kind of have to think about where, like, where is your time best spent, yeah. you know? Because the, the AdSense, although it's good and it does make some money, it's, it, for me, it's really not much compared to the pottery sales. Right. Like yeah, the actual totally. selling of pots yeah. is really the main chunk <laughs> of my business. I mean, there's definitely some millionaire YouTubers out there, but it's not us. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Just that year, I made like eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 off of like somebody who wouldn't have known me unless it was from YouTube. Right, and I'm like, right. Wow, like, you know, like yeah. I probably didn't make that from ad revenue that whole year. On yeah, YouTube. right, right. There's a lot of things I've learned from all those hundreds of thousands of pots I've made right. that I could share um, if I sit down and think about it while I'm throwing, if I just share little tips here and there. Yep, and yep. so that's that's kind of a lot of what I geared my, my videos towards. Yeah. So. When I was like just getting into pottery, I went into this shop. The guy looked at me and he said, yeah, potters can't make it as a full time. <laughs> like all potters, like, they have to have another job, you know, right. they just do it for fun because they love it and you yeah. can't be a full-time potter, it's not possible. And I was pretty young at that time, like I hadn't bought Mocha Monkey yet, but I was into pottery. Um, and I, I don't know if that made this big impact on me, like, oh, I can't make it as a full-time potter. Right. I have to go like do this other business first and then maybe the pottery can. Right. But now the pottery business by itself could easily for me be a full-time thing and it's being it's a full-time thing for you. Definitely. And I just want to get your impression on either the stigma that pottery can't be a full-time thing right. or it's really hard or you have to live on like, you know, $10,000 a year. You just have to sacrifice everything right. to be a potter. But the majority of the pottery shops in Seagrove out of the 60 or 70 that are here are full-time potters. So, yeah. you know, I definitely had that advantage to, to, you know, kind of discount that stigma. My wife and I lived in, in, a, in a bigger city for a little while, even while I was still making pottery. And I remember her being at the park one day and talking to the lady and the lady's like, well, what do you guys do? And she's like, oh, well, my husband's an artist. He's a potter. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> and she's like, why? And she's like, well, the whole starving artist thing. Yeah. And I'm like, man, like that's, I hate stigmas like that sometimes yeah. because they're just so horrible. And I, um, I've told a lot of potters, you know, or a lot of people at the beginning, I'm like, even my first apprentice, like I could see how good he was. And I'm like, dude, if you want to do this for a living, I'm like, you definitely can. Like, you're good. Like, I can tell. And he told me, he said, yeah, well, my parents really want me to get an MBA. And I'm like, and I'm like, well, I'm like, you can, and that's going to help you run the business side. But I'm like, if you really want to be a potter, you don't even really need that MBA. Yeah. Man. And, MFA is what you're talking about. No, right? no, actually, no. Oh, they MBA. want to get an MBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Oh. Um, yeah, I think probably even worse than that would be an MFA. Yeah. If you just want to actually <laughs> make pots for a living, like, I mean, it's not worse, but like, you, you don't, just don't need, need it. it. No, yeah. you don't. Like now, if you want to teach, if you want to be a professor of ceramics at a university, they probably want you to have an MFA. But in some ways, it's getting harder because you look on Instagram and like everybody's got an Instagram and everybody's trying to sell pots. Yeah. But I think if you really want to, like, yeah, you could definitely make it as a potter full time. I mean, I'm doing it. You're doing it. Plenty of people around me that are doing it. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, it, it's not going to come easy. Just like anything worthwhile, like you know, you're going to need to practice and get good at making pots. Like you can't just start and think next week I'm going to start selling pots. It's just yeah. not going to happen. The yeah. learning curve is steep. Um, but if you're committed to it, uh, yeah, you can definitely yeah. do it. And being a potter, you don't have to sit down and learn to throw production. But if you if you're creative, but you can force yourself to sit down and throw 100 coffee mugs that are all the same shape, it's going to enhance your creativity so much. Mm -hmm. So like that hard work will enhance whatever creativity you have for sure. Yeah. Majority of what I do, I really enjoy, and I'm very thankful that I get to get up and do something every single day that I really enjoy. But I can't say that every moment of every day is like bliss. Like yeah, there are right, times right. it's just like, 
I really don't want to do this right now, but I have to. And yeah. I mean, but that's just life. And then my, my last question is, how have you handled the balance between making money versus being happy in your life? I would rather, you know, make less money and be happy doing what I'm doing than make a pile of money. But, uh, but I, like I said, I'm still a very driven person. I want to succeed. So that's, uh, it is a balance, but I probably lean a bit more towards the want to be happy side. Yeah, yeah. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Matthew Kelly. We are going to have the whole studio tour in a separate video because that turned into a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and then the full interview, the whole hour long thing that we did with him, this was chopped up into what I kind of thought was the best pieces. Uh, and so we're, I'm gonna, I'll have the full interview up on my channel too. You guys can check that out but I thought this was really fun what did you guys think I want to make this a big part of my channel moving forward where two or three times a year I go visit other artists and I do a bunch of videos about them and then I do a big long interview with them uh, and so I want to know who would you guys want to see what studio spaces do you want to see what kind of work do you want me to explore so I dove really deep into wood firing and salt firing with Matthew Kelly and I got a bunch of videos and I dove deep into his life and his story uh, and I just had such a great time doing it that I want to do this with other others as well. So comment below who else would be super interesting to go see. I already have some three or four ideas, uh, but I'd love to know what you guys think. So again, check out all the other videos. Go check out Matthew Kelly Pottery's YouTube channel, Instagram. He has a sale April 30th. Uh, so thanks again so much to Matthew Kelly and his wonderful wife, Danielle Kelly, for having me. It was an amazing time. So, all right. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment, all the things. See you guys in the next video. Shh.